Hi, this is Shelley Kraft. We're coming to you live on SNN Live. We're at the Cambridge House International Conference here in Vancouver 2012. I have Mr. David Morgan of the Morgan Report. He is a featured speaker here at Cambridge and other conferences. And ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to silver, this is Mr. Silver. Hi, oh, Silver. How are you? Oh, Shelley, it's always great to be with you. Thank you very much. I'm doing well. Thanks. Excellent. Now, let's get right into it for our audience. Tell us about the Morgan Report and what are you speaking about at this conference? I'm speaking about silver, the China factor. Uh, a lot of people are worried about the economic situation and what's happening in China. And I know you've been there recently, so I'm going to actually do an interview with you later. But right now, I'm talking about silver and China and how it plays together. How does it play together? Well, China has been uh, a net exporter of silver 10 years ago of about 100 million ounces on an annual basis. Today, they import about 100 million ounces on an annual basis. Are they still producing their own and on top of it, they're importing another 100 million ounces of silver? The growth rate in China has been rather significant of what they're mining out of their own territory and they're adding on top of that, yes. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell my audience, and, and, and I want you to comment on this. Someone told me, I'm going to just go off the reservation for a minute and go to gold. And I know that they're waiting for the wedding season to come in China so that the gold prices can go up. Different for silver. Silver is used industrially in China for many of their products. Am I correct? Well, you're correct somewhat. There's a little bit of a distinction. In Asia, generally speaking, or actually accurately speaking, jewelry is used as an investment in the East. So the jewelry factor is about 50% of the market comes out of Asia. In fact, China is a big bulk of that. So when you look at silver jewelry from an Asian or an Eastern perspective, you're looking at it much differently than you are in the West. And most people don't understand that at all. Secondly, to add on to what you asked about the industrial side, true, but there is more and more growth in China for silver coinage and silver as an investment than there has been in quite some time. I think that trend's going to continue for a variety of reasons. What countries in general are the largest exporters to China of silver? Uh, your main countries would be Peru and um, Australia, primarily Australia. Uh, any of your big mining houses, such as like a Pan American Silver, for example, they mine all over the world, but that would be one company globally based that you know exports into China. A lot of Chinese import comes back out as export, but that's not what I'm talking about as far as what they use internally. So it's not convoluted, but you've got to understand the numbers because you'll see, well, so, well, they're exporting some, and David, you just said that they import it. Well, they do both, but what goes in from Pan America and, and gets smelted comes out to Pan American on an export. But really, it's been Pan American silver the whole time. It just went in as you know crude rock and out as fine ore, or, or fine silver, I should say. Another question that I have is, how deep are the reserves, you know, in China? And why is it that they would import? Are they running low on reserves? That's my question. Yeah, that's a good question. First of all, they're very close to the vest on what their long-term mining lives are. You can get some data in public companies, such as the Silver Corp that's in China. So if it's not China-based, you can get some pretty good data. If it is China-based, you're really not going to know. No, it's really the usage. I mean, any high-tech society requires silver. And since the Chinese are becoming more westernized by the minute with iPads, iPhones, uh, laptop computers, solar panels especially, infrastructure, automobiles, everything in a high-tech world that requires silver. They're silver investors without knowing they're silver investors. It's the build-out of the Chinese infrastructure and the high-tech electronic world that we live in that's putting the biggest demand and on top of that investment starting to catch on in China for both gold and silver. The gold imports in China on an official basis were up 600 percent first quarter 2012. Silver usually follows gold in those type of situations. So I'm not saying the Chinese government will buy silver, but it wouldn't shock me if they did. And it wouldn't shock me if we'd never find out just how much they're buying. And it wouldn't shock me that they become hoarders of silver, if you know what I mean. Right. 
the fact is that China was the last to go off the silver standard. And uh, silver does play an important role for them in a lot of ways. And again, an investment. Uh, they're encouraged really to look at the paper fiat system that they have had fail in China eight times. China was the first one to invent paper money. Marco Polo went there and he's astonished about a lot of things, but the number one thing that impressed him the most was that people would accept a piece of paper as final payment. But he brought that back to Europe, the rest is history. Now, David, I want to ask you a question. And I know our viewers and investors that are watching would have interest in your answer. What is the Chinese viewpoint on North American exploration companies from the standpoint of their interest as far as investing in them, looking at them as joint venture partners, looking at them as off-take uh, customers. What's your thinking about that? Well, I'll give you my experience, not my thinking. What I've seen being in Hong Kong several times, and I'm going back there in a couple of weeks, is they want producing companies or near producers that they can put a lot of money into and get a return on their capital. Uh, they're not too interested in expo exploration situations. They want to see that the meat's really there. Once they've determined that it's there, they're willing to invest significantly. In fact, I've been on record as saying I think most of the mining financing is going to come out of China from basically this point on. Not that Toronto won't fund some and not that Vancouver won't fund some, but the big bulk of the mid-tier to grow large growth companies that are really producing a lot of metal, it's coming out of China. But what about the reliability on the 43101 compliant reports? I mean, there, there comes a point in time where usage requires exploration and replacement of resources in the ground, simply put. So is it an educational learning curve? I mean, I, I'm looking at a hockey stick potentially, correct? Well, you're going to see as the need for commodities continues, and I believe we will, I mean, you can argue that the commodity cycle is over, I don't believe that at all, that you're going to see more and more need, and of course, they'll go down tier. They'll look for companies that are exploring or have a 43101 compliant resource, and I wouldn't, you know, it just takes a little thinking outside the box, not a lot, but you could see a conglomerate, as an example, come in and buy a basket of small, you know, micro cap or small cap mining concerns, put them into a portfolio and they have a bunch of stuff in the ground and they'll sort it out later because on a holistic basics basis, in other words, 10 companies or 20 companies in a portfolio, they certainly have the money to do that. And the Chinese mindset is very clear. They much rather have stuff in the ground, an asset, than some form of you know American debt or any other debt. So they're very consistent on what they want. They want real assets and whether they have to go down and you know a tier or two or three will they absolutely uh, how will they do it they actually have in my view enough money where they're really not interested in like a mining you know stock they again would probably buy across the border maybe form a holding company of some type so ladies and gentlemen I just want you to know we could do this for hours on end I have more questions right now and I'm sure he has answers and he's got questions for me because I've traveled in the same areas. Make a long story short, for more information, let's go first to the Morgan Report website. And what is that? TheMorganReport.com. We keep it simple, folks. I have David Morgan of TheMorganReport.com. He's a featured speaker at Cambridge. And let me tell you, he's one of my favorite interviews because he's got information, especially about silver. So. We're at the Cambridge House Conference. We're here in Vancouver, 2012. And again, my pleasure to have you, and thank you for coming on to SNN Live. Shelley, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. You got it.